Good morning, HTVB. Thank you, Pastor Miles, for giving me the joy and the privilege of speaking to you all the way from uh, Perth, Western Australia. I have a very practical message that I want to share with you this morning, which is entitled, On Being Sought and Light. It comes from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 to 16. So why don't we read the scriptures together uh, this morning. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth, Jesus said, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and then put it under a bowl. But instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Now, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's bow and we have a word of prayer. Father, I pray that this morning you open our eyes to behold wonderful things from this passage. Even though this passage is so familiar to many of us, I pray that this morning you will give us fresh insight. Help us to see things there that will enable us and inspire us to really become salt and light in this world. God, may you come and speak to us. As we prepare ourselves to enter 2021, may you give us this passion to really be an influence wherever you place us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, Jesus said two distinct things about us as his disciples in this passage. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 and 14, here are two things that Jesus say about you, about me, as his disciples. Firstly, he said, you are the salt of the earth. And it's interesting that the word you there, the preposition, is really not singular. It is plural, which means to say that it's not just talking to you as an individual, but it's talking to us as a people. And he said, you are the salt of the earth. Secondly, you are the light of the world. Now, the first thing you need to note is that the influence of salt and light, which is our identity, is really not based on what we say. It's not just based on what we do, but simply by being who we are. What makes salt and light work is simply by being present. It is their distinctiveness which makes them special, which tells us this, your presence, my presence, wherever God has placed us, makes a difference. You see, salt and light affects the environment simply by being there. So I want to challenge us as we enter into 2021 that we would prepare ourselves to be salt and light by first understanding clearly and contextually what Jesus is saying to us here in Matthew chapter 5. So I propose that we will look at salt and light one at a time. So question, what does Jesus mean by the salt of the earth? Now, we all tend to bring our own paradigms into the reading of the scriptures. Like when we think about salt, our mind will immediately think of salt as in the kitchen because that's what we are used to, right? So immediately you think about salt, you think about Jamie Oliver, you think about Gordon Ramsay. But so most sermons as a result on salt and light here in Matthew 5 would actually talk about uh, how salt would preserve, how salt flavors, which is what we do with salt in cooking. Is that right? Therefore, a sprinkling of salt will just make all things right. But do you know, brothers and sisters, that the Gospel of Luke actually defines specifically what Jesus had in mind when he talked about the salt of the earth. And in the context of discipleship, Jesus actually said in Luke chapter 14, verse 34 and 35, listen to this. He said, Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the salt nor for the manure pile, but it is thrown out. Now, listen carefully to this. What did Jesus have in mind when it comes to the use of salt at that time? He wasn't thinking about salt as it's used in the kitchen, but it is, he's thinking about salt that is used in the field, and in the manure pile. Is that what he says in Luke chapter 14? He's thinking about the field and the manure pile. Therefore, he was thinking about salt that is used as fertilizer in the field 
and disinfectant in the toilet. And actually, that is more in line with what is going on culturally and geographically during the time of Jesus. Now, if you remember, there is a body of water called the Dead Sea in Israel. And this sea, we all know, has a very high content of salt, so much so that you can literally float in the water effortlessly. You know, you can literally float there, lie on your back, float there and read a book because there's so much salt, you know, in, 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 in the Dead Sea. In fact, the salt content is so high that if any of you have ever been to Israel and you go and visit the Dead Sea, one of the things that your tour guide will always tell you is, no, whatever you may do, do not put your face into the water. Why? Because the, the salt content is so high that it will really stink your eyes. And some people can get blind because of this. And that is why anyone who's been to Israel will know this. It's because of the high salt content in the Dead Sea. And during the summer months, the water in the Dead Sea will evaporate even more and salt will be left behind along the shores in huge amounts. And then what happened is that the salt merchants would then come collect them and then sell them as fertilizer, sell them as disinfectant in huge bags. You see, salt that is collected from the Dead Sea is not pure sodium chloride which is used for cooking, but it can be a mixture of different types of salt, including potassium chloride or potash, which is actually used for fertilizer. So here's my point. Salt in the mind of Jesus, as he was talking about salt of the earth, is a great fertilizer that makes good things grow. Now, the other common usage of salt at that time was as a disinfectant in a manure pile. And here, we are not talking about animal manure, but we are actually talking about human waste, human manure. And at that time, please understand, they don't have flush toilets, right? So how do they do their business? They would actually do it on a pile of dirt, and then they, they will always have a box of salt that is next to them. So after the man finishes, uh, after the person finishes his business, he will take all the, take the salt and then sprinkle it over the manure so that it stops, it disinfects it and therefore stops bad things from growing. So that was what Jesus had in mind. Now, you put all that together and you get this vivid picture of what Christians are meant to do. You see, God plants us where we are needed in the marketplace, in our society, in the mission field, basically to promote the growth of that which is good and to prevent the growth of that which is evil. And brothers and sisters, this is the powerful influence of the church. We are meant to be the salt of the earth. And we will do this not by just what we say or what we do, but first and foremost, by being who we are. And we are the salt of the earth. You see, we are fertilizer that God plants us everywhere as fertilizer to actually cause good things to grow. We are disinfectant that will cause bad things to stop growing. I think that is the role of the Christian in the marketplace. That's the role of the Christian in our neighborhood, in our schools, in our campuses. We are fertilizer that, that, um, that cause good things to grow. We are disinfectant that cause bad things to stop growing. So this is who we are. So why don't you turn to your neighbor right now and tell them you are disinfectant. You are fertilizer because that's who we are. We are the salt of the earth. Okay, what about the light of the world? Now, you notice that light also has its positive and its negative, right? The positive side is that light can display, light can show up what is right and what is good, right? Where there is light, what is good can be seen clearly. So when the Christian is walking in the light of Christ, we become a shining beacon that draws man to God. But the reverse is also true. Light can not just display what is good, but light can also expose what is not good. Right? It exposes what is wrong. That's why when light comes on, all the cockroaches scatter. Why? Because darkness cannot stand the light. Because light exposes, light confronts. But this is what light does simply by being there. 
is another vivid picture of what Christians are supposed to do in order that the world may see. God plants us in our office, in our schools, in our campuses, in our neighborhood, so that our presence as the light of the world will exhibit what is right and expose what is wrong. So we point people to the good that is in God and we steer people away from the evil and the wickedness that is in this world. And that is why the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 to 16. Listen to this. Paul says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. And then you will shine amongst them like stars as you hold firmly to the word of God. Now, now that you know what Jesus actually meant by the salt of the earth and the light of the world, I think we have a fresh understanding, right? Of what it means to be salt and light. We are fertilizer that cause good things to grow. We are disinfectant that cause bad things to stop growing. We are light that exposes that which is wrong and it displays that which is right. See, and that's our role. By simply being there, by being distinctly different, we are playing our role as salt and light in society. Now, let me, in the light of this, outline for us three requirements that will enable salt and light to really operate effectively in this world. Okay, and I want to outline for you three key requirements. And remember, Jesus was not talking to us just as an individual because the word you, the pronoun use, uh, is actually plural, right? And it's talking to us as a corporate body. So here are three key requirements for us as a people. Number one is this. In order for salt and light to really work effectively, we need to have the right quality. We need to have the right quality. In order to fulfill its function well, salt must be salty. So question, can salt actually lose its saltiness? Personally, I think it's not possible physically uh, because it, salt cannot just change its DNA. You, you can't. See, in the same way, a born-again Christian has a new nature in Christ and we cannot change that. So the problem is not that our nature is changed, but rather it can be adulterated. Okay, it can be mixed and tainted by the things of this world. We have a new nature, but that nature can be mixed and tainted by the things of this world. And then it can no longer be distinctly different. Remember what happened to the people of Israel, right? In Psalms 106, verse 35 and 36. What was their problem? Here's their problem. They mingled with the nations and adopted their customs and they worshipped their idols, which became a snare, a trap. To them. See, once we lose our saltiness and we can no longer influence positively, I think we are no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. We lose our distinctiveness and we lose our ability to influence. See, we can become so like the world that people can no longer see the distinctiveness of Christ in us. And then our presence does not make a difference anymore. Now, Jesus actually asked in verse 13 this question, right? If salt has lost his saltiness, how can it be made salty again? You know what the answer is? I believe that the answer is this, is to go back to the Beatitudes and be like what Jesus calls us to be. Now, have you noticed that this passage that we just read about salt and light is actually sandwiched between two very major uh, treatments of Jesus when it comes to the Sermon on the Mount. One is the Beatitudes on top, and then after that, he talks about salt and light, and then he goes on to talk about the moral laws of God. So here's the thing. If salt has lost its saltiness, what must it do? I think it must go back to the Beatitudes, and we begin to live out who God has called the people of the kingdom to be. Now, it is the same with light. If our light becomes dim, then what must we do? You see, if our light has become dim, I believe we need to go back to the moral laws of God. You see, because if our light is shining clearly, then all we need to do is to put it on a stand and then let it shine by itself. And it will bring light to everyone 
in the house. It will draw all men to God and then they will glorify Him and the whole world will see. But if light is hidden, it is no use, right? We used to sing that old song, Shine, Jesus, shine. I'm sure you sang that before. But actually, it's a nice song, but it's not very accurate. I don't think it should be shine, Jesus, shine. Because Jesus is always shining, but it is shine, Christian, shine. Shine, church, shine. Say, we are supposed to shine. Okay, Jesus is always shining, but not us. So we, the, the song exhausts us to shine for Jesus. Now, how are we supposed to shine for the Lord? I think it is by holding ourselves to a higher standard of morality. That is why if you sort the Lord's of saltiness, go back to the Beatitudes. But if light has deemed, what must we do? Go back to the moral laws of God. We hold ourselves to a higher standard of morality in order to shine in this world. See, the world often lowers the moral standard to meet the people. That's what the world does. But Jesus is so counterculture that he actually raised the people to meet the moral standards. See, he never compromised that. So it's not just about not doing all the bad things like stealing and killing and murdering, but what Jesus did was to go on in Matthew chapter 5 to outline the inner workings of the law. That's how we shine for the Lord. You see, what Moses declared for the outside, for the people of Israel, Jesus actually took it to the inside. He took it into the heart. See, so you read the rest of chapter 5, it talks about this. While the law says, do not murder, Jesus said, if you are angry with your brother, you already committed murder. See, it's the issue of the heart now. The law says, do not commit adultery. But Jesus said, if you just look at a woman lustfully, you have already committed adultery in your heart. See, the law says, do not break your oath. But Jesus said, let your yes be yes, your no be no. You don't even need to swear. You just mean what you say and then you say what you mean. It's all about the inside. See, he even told the disciples in Matthew chapter 5, right? Do not worry about anything because worrying is a sin. And that's why Christians never worry, right? <laughs> and you know that's not true. See, what's my point? Here's my point. See, Jesus raised the standard of morality so high that it's almost impossible to fulfill it, isn't it? And that's true because he never expected us to be able to do this on our own strength and our, with our own willpower. But what we need is the power of the Holy Spirit and the truth of God's word. That's what we need. This is the only way that the world can see. And that's why it's so powerful. It is not our doing, but our being. And this is what it means to be salt and light. It begins by having the right quality. You see, you live out the Beatitudes and we uphold the moral standards of God. That is salt and light. And it begins by having the right quality. Here's number two. In order for salt and light to really work in this world, we need to also have the right quantity. You see, in the kitchen, we may only need a little bit of salt for flavoring, for preservation. But if we're talking about being fertilizer and being disinfectant, then we are talking volumes, isn't it? If we just want to light up a little room, then all we need is a little lamp. But if we want to influence society, I think we need more light. To be effective salt and light in society, we don't just need the right quality, but we also need the right quantity. In order to turn the tide of evil in our world, we need enough salt and light to actually change the trend. You see, one of the latest social studies that are done by the World Economic Forum have shown that if there is 25% in any gathering that is distinctly different, it can change the social trend. And we're not just talking about the quantity here, but we're talking about uh, the right quality to start with. So if there is 25% of really committed Christians, say, in any organization or in any church, it can begin to effectively fertilize and cause good things to grow and effectively disinfect and prevent bad things from growing in any company, 
any campus, any family, any organization. You see? And if we want to become trendsetters, then let us prepare to keep reaching out, keep evangelizing, keep discipling until we see enough salty salt and shiny light bursting into our nation. A really good target will be at least 25% so that we can change social trend. But let's not kid ourselves. If our churches are simply growing by transferring Christians from church to church, then we will never be able to let the world see. So until we see people saved, until we plunder hell and populate heaven, the needle of transformation has not moved at all. So brothers and sisters, we need greater quality of salt and light and we also need greater quantity of salt and light. And here's the third thing. We need to be in the right place. Right quality, right quantity, and we need to be in the right place. See, if we want to let the world see, if we really want to influence our world, we must make sure that salt and light is found in the right place. You see, salt is not useful as a fertilizer until it is in contact with the earth, right? Um, it is not useful as a disinfectant unless it is in touch with the manure. Now, it is not even useful as a flavoring in the kitchen unless it is sprinkled into the food, right? It must be in touch. Light, if it is hidden under a bed, it does not show the way or expose any danger that is lurking in the darkness. Light must shine into the darkness in order to dispel it. You see, a, a light that is shining into the sun, if you hold a, a candle to the sun, it's actually useless. See, for a candle to be really useful, for this light to be really useful, it must be found in the place of darkness. So what's my point? My point is this, salt and light are meant to function in the world and not just in the church. It operates by being present in this world and in places where darkness prevails. And that is why God did not call everyone to become pastors and missionaries, but He has called many of you here to the front lines of the marketplace to be salt and light so that the world may see. Come Monday morning, many of you are going to be scattered into the marketplaces of the world, and that's where you should be. See, you are going to work tomorrow morning, not just to get a paycheck, but you are there to make a difference in a broken world. Your work is actually a platform for you to function as salt and light in this world. Your work takes you to places uh, that your pastors can never go. Your work, you know, put you in touch with people that your pastors may never meet. See, I cannot walk into Citibank tomorrow morning and start preaching, right? But if you work in Citibank, then you have the right to be there as salt and light to fertilize the bank and cause good things to grow. You are there to be disinfectant that stops bad things from growing. You are there to be a signpost that will point people to a better kingdom and introduce people to a better king. And his name is Jesus. Amen.